We've talked a lot about wisdom over the past few months because we've been reviewing this book of Proverbs. And last week we covered Proverbs 8, verses 1 through 21. And I decided to stop there because I told you this was going to be a two-part sermon. So today we're going to pick up in Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 22. I've got a lot of material. I'm going to be moving very quickly, but I'm going to try to be very concise and hopefully I won't move too fast for you. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 22. Here it is on the screen. This is from the New King James Bible. It says, The Lord, that is all capitalized, so that's Jehovah, possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. Verse 23, I have been established. I highlighted that for you. From everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. Now, I want to pause for a moment because we've talked about the book of Proverbs being a book uh, of wisdom. Proverbs 8 begins by starting about wisdom. Verse 12, again, is talking about wisdom. But here, particularly in verse 22, we're still talking about wisdom, but there's much more to it than the attribute of wisdom. There's a lot more to it, and we're going to establish that now. I use the word establish as it's used here. If I'm going to establish it now, what does that mean? If I establish this building, if this building was established in 1940, where was it in 1939? It was not. So the reason I say that there's a difference in wisdom and what we're talking about here is because wisdom is not an attribute that God did not have. It wasn't something that he established. The Father, Jehovah, is eternal. Therefore, wisdom is eternal. It's, wisdom is an attribute. So we can't be talking about wisdom because if he established whatever this was, this can't be wisdom. Are we following? It can't be wisdom. Because if wisdom was established, that means there was a time that the Father didn't have wisdom. So whoever is speaking here, it says, Jehovah possessed me, let's look at it again, at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. So this indicates that there was an a origin. Whoever's speaking here had a beginning. Will we agree? Let's look at this word in the, in the Hebrew. It says, I was set up, I have been established, depending on if you have the King James or the New King James. And this word is nosak. And it says to pour out, especially a libation or to cast. By analogy, to anoint a king, to cover, to melt, to offer, to cause to. Now something that's poured out, if you pour something into a mold, there's a source for what's being poured. There's always a source for what's being poured into a mold. So if I have a mold of, let's say, this tabletop or this, this lectern top, and I pour something into it, it has an origin, okay? So if something is established, then there had to be a time when it didn't exist. So let's continue. The Septuagint, the Greek Septuagint. Now the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, of the Old Testament. And it uses this word, themelios. And it's something put down that is substruction of a building or a foundation. This is very important. The Greek means foundation. In other words, the undercarriage or the substruction of a building. I find that interesting because who's the cornerstone or the foundation of the Christian church? It's Jesus Christ. And we find that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. But let's go back to Proverbs 8. Okay, let's take a look at this. I have been established, we read. The next verse says, when there were no depths, Proverbs 8, 24, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. Now again, this cannot be wisdom because we're saying whoever's speaking here was brought forth. Wisdom has always been as far as the attribute because the Father has always been. I might be a little repetitive but I just want you to get the sense of it. And there are many times that the phrase brought forth is used in the Bible, but there are actually only four times in, the, in all of Scripture where the phrase is used in the particular Hebrew sense that it's used here in Proverbs chapter 8. 
you're seeing two of them right here. But the first time that it's used, here it is. It's in the book. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, what, this is what I wanted to show you first. Let's look at the Hebrew definition. The Hebrew definitions from Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew Lexicon says, to be made to writhe, be made to bear, to be brought forth. Now one thing that happens when a mother is in labor, what happens? She's writhing with pain a lot of times. Isn't that true? So, to made to bear, what does bear mean? To bear or beget or to have a child or to be brought forth. Now, there's different forms of this Hebrew verb, brought forth. And like I said, there's six different versions of it. Uh, the one's called the cow, one's called the polel, one's called the pulau. This is in pulau form. One's the hofold, the hithophel, and the hithpapel. That's a lot of stuff, isn't it? These are the six different forms of this Hebrew verb. And this particular one means to be born every time it's used in Scripture. It means that it has an origin. It comes forth from another. Every time it's used, and it's only used four times, it means begotten in the literal sense. And I want to show you the other times that it exists. Job chapter 15, verse 7. This is from the New King James. Are you the first man who was born? This is the same Hebrew verb that's translated brought forth in Proverbs chapter 8. Here's the fourth time. Psalm 51, verse 5. It says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. So we see that we've already seen the four times in all of the Bible that this Hebrew verb brought forth is used, and it means begotten or born from or the substance of, coming out of another. Okay, I want to make that very clear. Now when we go back to Proverbs chapter 8, well, let's read it again. When, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. We see that twice. Brought forth. Now the NIV right here where this term brought forth is used, I want you to see how the NIV words it because it's actually more accurate than the King James in this regard. It says, when there were no watery depths, I was, what's it say? Given birth. So whoever is speaking here, whoever this is, is saying, I was born, I was given birth. I came from someone, I have a source. So now hopefully we have a clear understanding of what we're talking about. Whoever speaking was established, they were given birth. They came from someone. They have a point of origin somewhere in time. So let's go back. We're going to review what we've already read with this understanding that we have. It says, the Lord, that's Jehovah, possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. Verse 24, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. Verse 26, while as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep. And it continues, verse 29, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him, as what? I'll highlight it for you. If I can get it to go. As a master craftsman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Who is this master craftsman who was beside, obviously, the father in all of creation that was brought forth, that was given birth? It's none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. And that might be shocking to some people, but Proverbs 8, 22 through 30 is Jesus Christ speaking before he came to earth. He was speaking through the pen, the penman of Proverbs. That was him. Wisdom personified, we could say. So this brings up a question. Uh, a lot of theologians believe that Jesus Christ is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. Most of us have been taught that. Almost everybody that will hear this message has been taught that 
but maybe a few denominations don't teach that. And it's offensive to many Christians when we say that Christ has an origin. But is it biblical? Well, I can't base it just on Proverbs 8. So we're going to look further here this morning. And I want to make this clear. The Bible does not teach that Jesus was created. And you say, well, wait a minute. If he wasn't created, how could he have an origin? We read it in Proverbs 8, but we're going to drive it home a little further. And keep in mind that all of my life, I believed, past tense, that Jesus Christ was a created being. I was taught by my church that God, Jehovah, created Jesus first, and that all other things were created through Jesus. And the Bible teaches that God has a son, and all things were created through Jesus. We're going to see that as we go through this message. So let's get started. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, it starts off this way. It says, giving thanks to the Father, that's God the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And it continues... Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's in Christ's blood. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And it continues. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, through Christ Jesus. All things created were created through Christ Jesus. So that in itself tells us that Jesus was not created. If all things were created through him, he didn't create himself. And this goes right along with 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, that many of us are familiar with. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. I want you to notice an Old Testament verse, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is from the King James Bible. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now this word goings forth is kind of a strange way of saying it. It's, it's the King James Bible. And in Hebrew, it literally means of family descent. And it has a root word that indicates that there was an origin. I want you to notice, here's the root word. Strong's H4161. This is for goings forth. A going forth, that is an egress. An egress is an exit, coming out of something. Or an exit, it says. Hence, a source or product brought out, that which came out, going forth, goings out. Do you get the picture? proceeded out. So we see here in Micah 5, 2 that his goings forth was from eternity past. Now let's continue. Micah 5, 2, we look at it again. This last two words, these last two words, from everlasting. Everybody likes to jump on that, especially people who haven't really studied this. They'll say, see, it says from everlasting, so that means no beginning. But no, that's not what it means, because the Hebrew word for everlasting is olam, olam. And it simply means time out of mind. It's so far back, we don't even know when it was. We can't recall. There's nothing that for us to even think about, because it's so far back, we can't go back that far. It does not mean no beginning. It does not mean no origin. You know, people say, well, Christ is everlasting. Oh, we will be, we're granted everlasting life, aren't we? But that doesn't mean we don't have an origin. So why can't Christ be everlasting but still have an origin? 
Now we have to address a very difficult text for a lot of people. John chapter 1, verse 1. And this is one that uh, those who believe that the Son is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, this is one of their favorite verses to use. Because it says, John 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that sounds kind of confusing. And I don't want to draw this out, but I'm going to take just a few minutes to explain a couple of things. Number one, I want to show you what this looks like in the Greek. I think I've shown this to you before. I'm going to make it a little bit larger. Can you see the red outlines? Can you see that on your screen there? And I want you to notice it says, in the beginning was the word. You'll see the Greek above the English there. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with. They've got the added in the brackets. The God, because it's ton theon in the Greek. And I look there, and you notice that that word for God, the first God, you see what the letters look like in Greek above it? It looks kind of like an O-E-O-V. I don't know the Greek alphabet. But that's what it looks like in English. And then the second, and the word was God. You notice there it's O-E-O. It looks like a little G of some sort, doesn't it? A small G. So we see that in Greek, when a, when a person reads this in the Greek language, they can see a difference between God the Father and the divine Son of God. There's a difference when they read this. But in English, it gets lost in translation because we have one word for God, and that's God. That's the word we use. And the, the problem is, when we read this in the English, is it's confusing, and it causes me to have a false doctrine. It can cause me to believe that Jesus is, in fact, God as the Father is God. Remember, we, we read in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, there's one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. So if we have... Two gods, that's not one God. Is it? No, it's not. So let's look at this in another. This is the emphatic dialog, and it shows the Greek text. I don't like what they did here, and I'll explain it. If you look there, you'll see again that they have ton theon, and they have it written in Greek, and they have the God, and then they put and a God. That word a should not be added. It's unnecessary. It's not there in the text. It doesn't read that way, but they chose to do this because they were trying to make a point. You don't change God's word to try to make a point. You study to know what it actually says. Amen. We should not be changing God's word. It should not say a God. Because if Jesus is a God, guess what? Now we've got more than one God. And the Bible says there's one God, the Father. Isn't that true? So when I look at this again, I want you to notice down where it says chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Logos, that's the word, and the Logos was with God. And I want you to notice that they took the time, even in a Catholic document, <clears throat> they took the time to capitalize the whole word God, much like we do Lord in the Old Testament when we see the word Jehovah. So that first one is all capitalized, and then when it says, and the Logos, that's the word, was, notice it's God with a small O-D. So it's kind of like how we can tell the Lord Jehovah from the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. They decided to do that in this translation. And believe it or not, the Catholics recognize this. They know that this is the case. So some Bible translations say this, and this makes it much more clear. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was divine. The Father is divinity, therefore he can only beget or have a divine child, right, of his own, his only begotten. Now, I want to take just a minute. Why is this important? Why is it important to look at the Greek? I want to take just a moment to cover something, and that is in John chapter 21, where Peter said to Jesus, or Jesus said to Peter, rather, Peter, do you love me? We've all read that text. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love he me? He said it three times. And, and it's confusing when you read it if you don't read it for what it says in the Greek. Because in English, there's only one word for love. And that's love. But in Greek, there are four words for love. You have agape, phileo, eros, and storge. Four words for love. So let me just give you a picture here. When Jesus was talking to Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me? He was saying, Peter, 
Do you agape me? Agape means that he would be willing to die for him, a self-sacrificing type of love, the love that Jesus has for everyone here. That's agape love. I would give my life for you. So Jesus is asking Peter, Peter, do you love me enough to give your life? Do you agape me? You know what Peter said? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. I love you like a brother, but I'm not willing to lay my life down for you. That's basically what he was saying. How many times did Peter deny Christ? Three times. Peter asked, Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? And Peter made it clear, I love you like a brother, but I'm not ready to die. Does that change the whole meaning of that? So when Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Would you die for me? Peter says, I love you. I love you like a brother. I'm sorry, I would die for my brother. But Peter was a little selfish there. And then Jesus asked him again, Peter, do you agape me? Would you die for me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I, I, I love you like a brother. Well, the third time Jesus asked Peter, he said, Peter, do you phileo me? Do you love me like a brother? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. Does that change the meaning of that text? Because when we read it in English, the word love only has one meaning. Well, it has many meanings, but the word is only one. So we can be confused as to what type of love that is. So when we look at the word God in Scripture, we need to understand which Greek word is being used when we're looking at John 1.1. 1, 1. It takes the confusion out. Everybody following so far? Let's move along. Let's move along. John chapter 1, verse 3 says, All things were made through him, that's through Christ, and without him, without Christ, nothing was made that was made. In other, word, in other words, there's nothing that was created that was created without Christ. So was Christ created? No, he couldn't be. There's, there's actually a lot of information on this, but let's continue on. Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 2. This particular verse changed my complete understanding of, before I show this to you, I just want to blank the screen. Um, it changed my complete understanding of who the Father and the Son are. Did your screen just go black, Ed? <laughs> I want to stop here because most of us that have been here, that have been through this series, we understand Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Daniel interprets the dream. And basically that dream took Nebuchadnezzar from the time of his kingdom all the way through to the coming of Christ, which is still in our future. So we're still living in Bible times. We're still living in the prophecy that Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar about, that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. So I'll just read this to you. Daniel chapter 2. I could do this from memory because this was one of the texts that I was very familiar with in the faith that I came from and the denomination I was in. Daniel chapter 2. He gives Nebuchadnezzar this timeline of what things that are going to occur. And then in cha chapter 2, verse 44, here's what it says. And in the days of these kings, we're talking about the time of the end, the times that we are living in, I believe, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It, that's God's kingdom, shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. In other words, worldly kingdoms will come to an end, but God's kingdom will be forever. And I was driving home from work one day after someone had asked me, what do you believe about the father and the son? And I had been praying about this because I didn't want to tell him what I had been taught all of my life, but I wanted to give him a Bible answer that, that could come straight from here. And I'm driving home from work, and it popped into my head. I didn't hear a voice or anything. It's just the thought came to me. I was thinking about verse 44, and I said, I said it out loud. I'm driving down the road. I said, what's the next verse say? And I, I couldn't remember. So I pulled my truck over, and I got this old torn and tattered Bible out. And I turned to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, and here's what I read. Or verse 45, rather. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass thereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation is thereof sure and you say well so what 
So what? What, what, what does that mean? We, okay, we know the kingdom's coming. We, we get it. But there's more to it than that. When I read this text and I said, for as much as you saw the stone, who is the stone? We asked earlier. Look, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. There are other texts too, but I'm just showing you this for time's sake. We go back to Daniel chapter 2, verse 45. Notice that this stone was cut out of the mountain. What's that representative of? A stone always comes from a mountain, just like a son always comes from a father, right? A father, you can't have a son if he doesn't have a father. He can't have the stone if you don't have the mountain. Who is the mountain? It must be the father. The stone was cut out of the mountain. And notice this, without hands is the next part of that verse. Without hands. Now, the stone Christ is Christ. The mountain represents the father. But what does without hands mean? Well, let's look at what with hands means. And then we can determine without hands what that means. If we look at hands here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, it says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. So hands in the Bible denote creation. What do we do with our hands? We can make things. We do things. I can pick this Bible up. I can, I can write. I can draw. We make things with our hands. So in the Bible, when it's talking about the work of God's hands or his son's hands, we're talking about creation. So when it says here that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, he wasn't created. He was begotten. He's a chip off the old block, so to speak. He's the substance of the, the father as a, a stone is the substance of the mountain. Does that make sense? It's, it's beautiful to me. Cut out of the mountains. And we're going to go back. We're going to look at Genesis 1.26 and see a type of this in just a little bit, and we'll do that very quickly. But it's, it's an image or a pattern that we see when God said, I'll just, I'll just hit you with it just a little bit. When God said, let us make man in our image, we have Adam, who was created from the dust, and where did Eve come from? She came out of Adam. The son came out of the father. We'll, we'll get back to that. I'm going to sound that down a little better for you. Here's another prophecy that uses the word begotten regarding Jesus Christ. I will declare the decree of Jehovah. He has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. This is before Jesus came to earth, which shows that he had a pre-human existence, that he was begotten from the Father. The word for begotten that's used here in Psalm 2-7, take a look at this. It's yalad, to bear, to beget, lineage, birth, born, to bring forth, to bring up. And this goes right along with Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 through 31. This supports what we read there as a bringing forth, a begetting, a coming forth from. Notice here, Hebrews chapter 1 in the New Testament, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, this is the Father speaking, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I shall, will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This idea that Christianity has about the father and the son being co-eternal takes away the fatherhood and the sonship. It removes it. And it makes God say something that's not true. How could he call Jesus his son if he's not truly his son? He can't. That would make the father and the son liars, and we know that's not the case. So what does it do? It shows that there's a true father and there's a true son in heaven. And it was through the son that the father created everything that was created. Through Christ Jesus. Look at the Greek word for begotten here in Hebrews chapter 1. The Greek word is geneo. And they use the word here to procreate. I don't, that's, that can be the case, but it can also be, as you see, to bear, beget, be born, bring forth, be delivered, to spring out of. So this understanding, because I don't believe that God procreated Christ, because that's using the word create. The word that's used is begotten, to beget, to bring forth. 
And why is that important? Because the Bible says that Jesus, everything was created through Christ that was created. So I can't believe he was created based on what the Bible says. And this again supports Proverbs chapter 8. It's nearly the exact same definition as the Hebrew word for begotten. Now let's go on to verses 5 and 6 of Hebrews chapter 1. It says, For unto which of the angels has he, that's God, said at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The next verse says, And again, when he brings the first begotten into the world, he says, Let all of the angels of God worship him. Notice it says, and again when he comes to the world. So when I look at verse 5, this is speaking about Christ prior to coming to earth. And then in verse 6 when it says, and again when he bringeth the first begotten, I know that's all together, that's the way it's written in the King James, into the world he said, let all of the angels of God worship him. So in the context of these two verses, and all of Hebrews chapter 1, if you read all of Hebrews chapter 1, this shows that Jesus was a son before he came to earth. It's very clear. It's very clear. This is not simply a role. It's not simply a title, as most theologians want to portray. They want to give him a role of being a son and a father the role of being a father. No, it's a literal father and a literal son. The Greek word for first begotten literally means firstborn. That's what it literally means. So this raises a question. We've established that he cannot be uh, co-eternal with the Father. But he came forth sometime in eternity past. Christ was before anything that was created. Is everybody clear on that? So the next question that comes up is, is Jesus co-equal with the Father? And let's take a look at this. Co-equality, I believe, is different than equality. And you'll see what I mean as we go through this. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I want to make it clear, and I've done this before, it does not say equal to God. It says equal with God. In the Garden of Eden, the man and the woman were equal. Eve was equal with Adam. But Adam had headship. He was here first. He had seniority. He was given headship. But it doesn't mean that the woman's not equal with Adam. Is she equal to Adam? Well, I'm sure, you know, the, the Bible calls the woman the weaker vessel, and it doesn't mean that that's weak in mind or anything like that. She's more delicate than a man. Well, let's face it, we're created differently. We're different creatures. We're, we're different types of, of creature. We're, we're the same type, but we, we interact differently. We think differently. Our bodies are used for different functions. The woman is the one who begets. The man doesn't do that. And that's really quite a blessing as you're going to see here in just a little bit. It's a blessing that the woman has that. And I'll say this, according to the scriptures, before sin, birthing a child was not painful. So when you're living in God's kingdom, if there are going to be children there, birthing a child is not going to be a painful thing. Because God said, because you've done this, you'll bear children in pain. So that tells me that there was no pain. It was a natural thing is what we were created to do. So the woman was equal with the man, but I'm sure even in this room there are men who can pick up things that women can't. Physically, men are made to do heavier work. That's just how, how we were created. But it doesn't take your equality to the man away. Or with the man, I should say. So when he says here that Jesus did not consider it robbery, or he not thought it not robbery to be equal with God, why is that? In the same text, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it answers that question. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. He exalted Christ and given him a name which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. You see, God gave Christ equality. He gave him equality. What does that mean? 
Does that mean that Christ isn't subordinate to his father? No, the Bible is very clear that God is the head of Christ. But he's equal with God in the sense that the father is divine, so his son is divine. And how can he consider it robbery to take equality or be equal with his father when his father has given him equality? I can't rob you of something you've given me. If Virginia gives me her scarf and says this is a gift, I can't rob her of that. It's a gift. It's mine. She gave it to me. And it was hers to give. So if the father wants to give equality to his son, who are we to say that it's not? Amen. And from my background, boy, this scripture, I, I stayed away from these verses. It was scary because, I, no, he can't be. But once you understand what that equality means, we're going to drive that home in just a few more minutes. We're coming back to that thought. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. An heir is someone who inherits something. Through whom also he made the worlds. So all things were created through Christ, who is the heir. He's been appointed heir of all things. The Father can do that. It's his Son. He inherits it. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, that's the Father's glory, and the express image of the Father's person, and upholding all things of the world and by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus is the express image of his Father's person. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's going to do everything the way his father would do it. Why? Because he relied on his father for doing those things. Not because he took it on his own. Because it was given to him and his father helped him when he asked for it. It's a beautiful relationship. It really brings the father-son relationship into a much closer understanding. And it really shows what the father did in giving his son for us. How hard is it for you to give one of your children on behalf of another person. And this is what the Father did. And when we take the sonship of Christ away, we take the love that the Father had away. We really do. It diminishes that love if we don't believe that he truly gave his son. Verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 1, it says, having become so much better than the angels. This is talking about Christ. As he has by what? Inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Remember I said in Sabbath school earlier that he inherited his name, a more excellent name than anyone that was created because it's more excellent than the angels even. What name did he inherit? He inherited the name of his father, Jehovah. I'm a Martin because my dad is a Martin. I inherited that. And I have some of the characteristics of my dad because I'm literally my father's son. Jesus is literally his father's son so he can have his father's name. I believe when we use the name Jehovah, we should use that exclusively for the father. That's my feeling. And I believe that there are times in scripture where we can see that that's Christ working. But if the father is telling Christ to do something, the father and his son are working together. Christ said, I do nothing of my own but what my father tells me. But how are we sons and daughters? How are we sons and daughters? Let's take a look at this in Romans chapter 8. You have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You see, we are adopted sons and daughters. But Jesus is a literal son. He's a literal son. He was begotten of God. He's divine because the Father is divine. He's the very substance because he came out of his father. And here we are in this world, we're sinners in need of a savior. But God adopts us into his family, making us sons and daughters. I want you to notice the following. I've got this illustration here. Baptism of Jesus was not for himself. You see, when we're baptized, we're symbolically dying to our old way. The, the baptism of going under the water is, a, is an outward expression of our 
faith in God. And we're outwardly expressing that we're dedicating our lives to the Father and His Son. And when we go under that water, it's symbolic of dying to the old person. And when we come up, it's like a being born again. It's a rebirth. We come up fresh and washed clean. It's, all, it's symbolic. There's no uh, mystical things that happen at our baptism. Something uh, extraordinary did happen at Jesus' baptism, though. His father spoke. His father spoke. And he said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Isn't that what he said? He was pleased about his son. Now, with us, we are born again as we, symbi symbolically born again as we come up out of the water. Now, the beautiful thing about this is we are, we can't help it. We were born into sin, weren't we? There's nothing we can do about how we were born and the condition that we were born into. And then we're, when we become Christians, we're born again in Christ Jesus. This cleanses us. Christ Jesus can cleanse us from that sin. Now, the beautiful thing is that Jesus was born from his Father. He is divine because his Father is divine. Was he born again? He was born again in the flesh. Born first from the Father and then born again from a woman in the flesh. Now, we're born from a woman in the flesh and born again into Christ. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And through this, we become partakers of Christ's divine nature. It doesn't mean we become divine, but we can partake of what he's done for us. We can come, become partakers in the things that he's done. And Peter tells us this. Take a look at this. 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, grace and peace. This is verses 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. And it continues, by which we have been given, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Is Peter talking about a future time or is he talking about now? Now. We can be partakers of the divine nature now. This is amazing. Partakers of the divine nature of Christ today, right now. And this idea of Jesus being born twice, it seems to be proven further in the book of Acts. Let's take a look. Acts chapter 13. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. And you'll see why I say this in a moment. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. This is pointing back to Christ's first birth and then saying, I have raised him up again. See, these verses clearly show that Jesus was brought up, as Proverbs says, before his earthly existence. He was brought up or ra and then raised up again here on the earth. Does that make sense? In his human existence. Also, we see that Jesus was born from the Father in eternity past and born again in the flesh, showing us a type of our living perfectly in the flesh as born-again Christians. It's, it's beautiful. We are made righteous by Christ, not in anything that we do. Because 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, for he made, that is, God made him who knew no sin, who's him who knew no sin? Jesus. To be sin for us. God made him who knows no sin to be sin for us, that we might become righteous of God in him. That's beautiful. Christ became sin for us. He left his habitation of the heavens to come here. So when we go back to Acts chapter 13 and we read, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, that he hath raised up Jesus again, we see that God has raised up Jesus again. He brought him up in eternity past, as one brought up with him, it says, and he brought him up again through Mary and Joseph here on the earth. And this goes right along with the language 
It's in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 30. As one brought up with him, it says in the King James. It's a father and son relationship, a literal father and son relationship. Let's consider one more point. I told you we were going to take a look briefly at Genesis 126. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now notice there's a plurality, let us, that's more than one, that's the father speaking to his son. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then in the next chapter, what do we read? Well, notice how this is in the image of God, okay? Here it is, Genesis chapter 2, this is from the modern King James Bible. It says, and Jehovah God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh underneath. And Jehovah God made the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now I want to ask you, where did Adam come from? From the dust of the ground, right? He came from the dust. Now all of the animals we know were created from the dust. That's what the Bible tells us. But man, it says, was created in the image of God. They were made in the image of, let us make man in our image. So here the man's made from the dust, just like the animals. But the woman came out of the man, a rib from Adam. She came out of Adam. You and I and everybody that we know came out of a woman, but not Eve. Eve came out of a man. That's pretty amazing to me. So God made the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman, and he brought her to the man, it says. Let's look at the next verse. And Adam said, Adam recognized this, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Then it says, therefore uh, shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be what? One flesh. Now he says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Adam realized she was the substance of him. He, he understood that somehow. He had to take it by faith when God said, here's this beautiful woman. And he sees her and he says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Let me ask you, was Adam cut when a rib was taken? It says God opened him up. It says that that stone was cut out of the mountain. You see a correlation? So this is in the image of God because of the fact that the Son came forth, came out of, was born from the very substance of the Father. John 1.18 says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Here's a good question for you. Where is the bosom? It's right here, isn't it? Where are my ribs? They're right here. And this is declaring that Christ Jesus was in the bosom of the Father. He came from the Father. Just as Eve came from the rib of Adam, we could say that, that Christ came from the bosom of his Father. The, Eve came from the bosom of Adam. Notice these words too in Genesis. And I, I emphasize this a little bit. Just the last sentence there it says and they shall be one flesh were they one person or two they were two individuals but they were one how were they one well let's look at what jesus said he said here in john 10 30 i and my father are one and so many people confuse this into thinking that they make one god and they put another person in there called the holy spirit and they believe in this three-part god but no, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. He didn't include the Spirit in that, the Holy Spirit, this third person that a lot of people believe in. And then he said to, to Adam and Eve, they shall become one flesh. So how are Jesus and his Father one? How are Adam and Eve one? They were one nature. The Father and Son were one nature. They were divine. And Adam and Eve were one nature. They were human. They were one substance because Christ came forth from his father. Eve came out of Adam. And they have one purpose. 
So they are, they are one in purpose, in nature, and in substance. Remember, the title of the sermon is Wisdom Personified. And this is done in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, it says, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because through Christ all things were created. Verse 30 says this, But of him you are in Christ... But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So in closing, I want you to open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 8. And we're going to read the final verses, beginning with verse 32. Proverbs chapter 8. Now remember last week we talked about this righteousness and wisdom. We started to see a transition of wisdom being more than just an attribute. We started seeing that last week. It is an attribute, but notice here, pick it up, Proverbs chapter 8. Uh, verse, I'll read verse 31 because I don't believe I read this before. It says, Rejoicing in his inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. That's Christ speaking. Verse 32, Now therefore listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not disdain it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtain, obtains favor from Jehovah. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. I'd say that's still Christ speaking. Isn't that true? We look at this. Wisdom personified in Christ Jesus. The literal begotten Son of God. Through whom are all things created. So when I look at Christ Jesus, this wisdom personified, I can look at Proverbs chapter 8 and see the attribute of wisdom. But when I get to verse 22, there's definitely a line there that's, that seems to me is drawn in the sand where Christ begins to speak about his very existence and showing us that he was brought forth from his Father in eternity past. 